What's going on guys? Today we're taking a look at the Samsung C49 HG90. Their brand new 49 inch 32 by nine, super ultra wide curved 3840 by 1080 VA quantum dot HDR display. Which upon first glance, most people's reaction to this product is why? Well, today we'll attempt to answer that very question. Level up your game with the latest mechanical keyboards from Mastrop, like the brand new Mastrop Alt, a 67% board with RGB lighting, aluminum frame, dual USB-C ports, and your choice of switches. Join the first production of the Alt and receive 10 bucks off your next keycap set, a unique serial number etched into your board, and more. Click the link in the description to catch this exciting drop before it ends. Now I just rattled off a big chunk of the product's core specs, but there's still a lot to talk about here, and I'm very interested in this product because it is specifically targeted and designed for gamers. Right now you can get the panel for about $1,000 depending on where you look, and it does support FreeSync too, so it's ready to go for HDR with a fairly generous range of 36 to 144 hertz, and that's of course with the help of AMD's low frame rate compensation technology that is built into FreeSync 2. You get a super fast one millisecond gray to gray response time and a gorgeous 1800R curve. However, I felt like it could be even more curvaceous, and here's why. The QLED technology that's built in here isn't the greatest for viewing angles, and since the panel is so wide, any text in particular that's on either extreme side of the panel looks a bit dimmer and a bit more distorted than it does right in front of you. So it stands to reason that if the curve was just a bit more aggressive, then those edges of the panel would be facing the end user more dead on and would thus reduce the image distortion. Just a minor gripe there. Now, since this is a gaming panel, it's certainly not aimed at working professionals in need of outstanding color reproduction, as we're only seeing an NTSC 1976 color gamut and 92% Adobe RGB. Now, don't think that means the colors are shit or anything. In fact, they're actually pretty good as we'll see later, and they're light years ahead of any TN panel on the market right now, but there are certainly better options out there if you're looking to do some color grading, graphic design, and similar. As far as the overall aesthetic of the panel, that's entirely subjective. I think it looks pretty good. It's very classy. It looks Looks like it could actually go in a full-blown battle station or fit in just fine in a corporate office. Uh, it does have a touch of class to it, looks very professional overall. The bezels, at least on the top and sides, are fairly thin, I've definitely seen thinner, and the bottom one is the thickest of them all, but it's fairly tasteful and there's a little bit of a Samsung branding in the middle, not too obvious. There are some OSD buttons for navigating the on-screen display, just below, off to the right. The button on the right is actually a little joystick for easy navigation, and it controls pretty much 90 of what you would need in the OSD. There aren't a ton of features in here, which I actually prefer over having an overwhelming number of them that I'll probably never touch. Some notable ones are picture mode, picture by picture, the option to enable or disable FreeSync, a black equalizer, which actually brightens up the blacks on screen so that you can see enemies that are hiding in the dark more easily, and a bunch of others. What I really like is that you can save any combination of these settings to one of three custom profiles, and then switch between those profiles with one of the three buttons located to the left of the joystick. This would be great if you wanted to have separate profiles for gaming, productivity, and daily web browsing, for example. Overall, the OSD is super intuitive, it's easy to navigate, and it has this cool edgy aesthetic that says, I'm a gaming monitor. The stand is made of plastic with a super wide triangular base, and it features height, tilt, and swivel adjustment. There's a back panel on the spine that actually comes off and allows you to route your cables very discreetly so you don't even see them from the front end. It's actually very nice. There's a cool white LED ring back here that you'll probably never see, along with a 100 by 100 vase mount if you wanna mount this sucker to the friggin' wall. Just make sure you use studs. As far as I.O., you get two HDMI 2.0, one DisplayPort 1.2, and a mini DisplayPort with included cables for each interface. There's also mic and headphone jacks, a trio of USB 3.0 ports for upstream and downstream use, and of course your full-size AC power. So now that all that boring stuff's out of the way, let's discuss what it's actually like to game on this behemoth of a panel. Essentially, it's kind of like an ultra-wide experience, but just wider. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but what I mean by that is, while it's completely breathtaking and an amazingly immersive experience, there's not as much of a jump from ultra wide to super ultra wide as there is from 16 by nine to 21 by nine. I mean, the first time I saw an ultra wide panel, I was like, wow, this is incredible. And then the first time I saw this panel, I was like, this is slightly better than an ultra wide panel. It didn't have that same wow factor. And I think a part of that is because a regular ultra wide monitor already fills up a good chunk of your peripheral vision, at least when you're sitting as close to the monitor as I do, which is maybe about 
a little bit less than an arm's length away. So I personally don't think that these super ultra wide displays are much more immersive than a regular ultra wide panel, but where they do become much more advantageous is in games like PUBG or Fortnite, where you're in a massive map with tons of other players who could be coming at you from any direction. In that sense, the wider field of view allows you to spot enemies much quicker without having to physically turn or move your mouse. Fortnite in particular, because you can't really turn your head while you're running like you can in PUBG. I would say that's one of the best, if not the best, gaming-centric features of having a display this wide. Now, while it's really nice to see more of your environment by simply scanning your display left to right, the 3840 by 1080 resolution isn't gonna be for everyone. And some users are inevitably gonna feel smushed or smashed down and are gonna be wanting those extra vertical pixels. Um, other users will be able to look past it or get used to it just fine. So it's one of those things that you have to check out in person and decide for yourself if it's right for you. Now, as far as driving this display goes, you're looking at about 4.1 million pixels for this particular resolution, which puts it at about 0.4 million pixels more than 2560 by 1440. So it's a little bit more difficult to run than that, um, but it's still uh, less than half of the pixels that you would find at 4K, which is like 8.3 million. So overall, it's much easier to drive than 4K. And I think as long as you have something like a GTX 1070 or similar, you should be able to handle this resolution natively, no problem. The one millisecond response time here is awesome for gaming. Uh, when you're turning quickly, there's very little motion blur. Everything stays razor sharp and just looks phenomenal. Pair that with the free 144 hertz and you're getting a truly buttery and delicious gaming experience through and through. Now the HDR implementation in a Windows environment, however, is a much different story. The one HDR enabled game that I played for this video was Far Cry 5 and the results I saw enabling HDR were quite lackluster. Instead of creating a wider color gamut or dynamic range, uh, what I saw were extremely blown out highlights that were so washed out that I was actually losing detail in the image. It was virtually unplayable because uh, it just looked so bad and it was actually hurting my eyes. That's how bright it was. HDR on Windows is kind of hit or miss right now because there are so many moving variables like your graphics drivers playing nicely with the Windows drivers and so forth that a TV paired with a console, for example, just don't have to deal with. And that's why it looks a lot better and works just a bit more smoothly on that platform as opposed to a Windows-based PC. Dimitri from Hardware Connects actually did a fantastic video recently on HDR gaming in a Windows environment. I'll put a link to that in the description. You should definitely check it out if you want to learn more about HDR in Windows. Finally, as this is a QLED display, we are subject to potential backlight bleed, which are those nasty hot spots of light that you see coming from behind your monitor, usually around the edges of your screen. Um, and that's because the QLED technology is really just a variation of LED LCDs, which is what creates those hot spots in the first place, instead of uh, OLED panels, for example, where each pixel is its own light source and backlight bleed is really not a problem at all. Fortunately, the C49 suffers from little to no visible backlight bleed, so even really dark scenes won't be affected. Uh, and one of the reasons why we've started to see backlight bleed become less of a problem with these QLED panels is because companies like Samsung have been putting in anti-reflective LCD panels into these displays to help mitigate the issue. In closing, I think it's pretty obvious who this panel is intended for, um, gamers for one, obviously, but more specifically, AMD users who can actually leverage that FreeSync technology. I think that's sort of a make or break here. Um, you really want to be taking advantage of that if you're going to spend a thousand dollars on a panel like this. I think it's also safe to say that you have to be really into gaming to enjoy this monitor to its fullest. I mean, obviously you can do web browsing, you know, 21920 by 1080 panels side by side, essentially. Um, but I think where it really shines is in the gaming environment. So if you're not gonna be gaming on it constantly, then it's probably not the panel for you. And there's probably a better model out there that can do what you want to do better than this can. Again, gaming though, it's freaking awesome. The $1,000 price tag is pretty steep, but for the amount of screen that you're getting and just for such a unique product, I think it's actually pretty cool, especially since you are getting that adaptive refresh rate in there. I think that's huge. Um, and obviously going the FreeSync route like Samsung did is gonna also cut costs down. If this was a G-Sync display, I don't even wanna know how much that extra silicon built in would cost the end user. So I don't know. You guys let me know what you think of this panel in the comments below. Some people will think it's super silly and still why, and I totally understand that. Uh, and other people will get a kick out of it. Let me know which side of the fence you're on or if you're something completely different down in the comments below. Apart from that, guys, I'm gonna get the heck out of here. Toss a like on the video if you enjoyed it. You can also subscribe to the channel for more tech stuff coming at you really soon. If you would like to follow me on Floatplane to watch my videos a week early without ads, I'll put a link for that in the description below. You can check that out anytime. Guys, thanks again for tuning in. Have a good one, and I'll see y'all in the next video.